Welcome back to another special edition of Endocrine Feedback Loop. Yet again, we get to sit down with the lead investigator of a study we recently reviewed here on the podcast, and we'll hear how she developed the idea for her study and her thoughts on some of the questions we brought up during that episode. I recommend that you first listen to episode 18, Trends and Disparities in DKA Admissions. That month, we reviewed a paper published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism entitled National Trends in Pediatric Admissions for Diabetic Ketoacidosis 2006 to 2016. The first author of that paper joins me today and it's my pleasure to welcome Estelle Everett into our virtual recording studio today. Estelle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Stell is a clinician scientist at UCLA and at the VA hospital in Los Angeles, California. She received her MD at UCLA and then went to Johns Hopkins for residency, fellowship, and a master's degree, after which she returned to UCLA. Despite being early in her career as an endocrinologist, she has already published several important papers looking at the relationship between socioeconomic status and diabetes outcomes. So we are delighted to get to speak with her today. What we'll do today is, first of all, ask her several larger questions about the research that she conducts and then get into the specific study that we reviewed a few months ago. So, Estelle, first of all, why don't you give us an overview about how you developed your interest in looking at socioeconomic status and diabetes outcomes in the first place? I would say throughout my clinical training and practice, I've evaluated and managed many patients from a wide range of social backgrounds and a variety of clinical settings. And through these experiences, I've noted large differences in patient outcomes based on the patient's background and or where they received care. And so one of the reasons I became a researcher is because I wanted to better understand why these differences occur so that we can improve outcomes in the most vulnerable populations with diabetes. And in several of your studies that you've done, you use large databases. Not many of us have much experience with that. So I thought it would be helpful for our listeners if you give us an overview. Start with, first of all, why? what's the advantages of using these databases? Why would one choose to do research utilizing this information source in the first place? Sure. So as I mentioned before, diabetes care and patient characteristics vary so widely across the U.S. And so when we do research that's focused in single centers or regions or even multi-centered studies, the populations in those studies may not actually represent all patients or what is occurring in the general population in the U.S. And so when we use a large national database like the Kids Inpatient Database that we use, which samples 42,000 hospitals across 46 states at a rate of 80%, we get a nationally representative sample, and so the results are more generalizable. Also, because of the large sample, we're better able to evaluate outcomes in smaller subgroups. Sure, that makes sense. And so give us then the flip side of that. So when you're using these databases, what are intrinsic limitations that are just baked into using those databases? What are questions and concerns that you know that you're going to have to to grapple with up front? Uh, and, And how do you try to address those? Although these databases have many benefits, there are, as you mentioned, several limitations. And this particular data set leverages hospital billing data. So we can see what procedures and admissions occur when certain populations on large scale. But because this draws from administrative records, we have limited data on important social demographic characteristics or medical history that would be useful for more nuanced investigations. So we lose more of the granular clinical information as well that is helpful to put context to these admissions, for example, labs, whether someone has a new diagnosis of diabetes versus known, whether it's a readmission, whether the patient has used diabetes technology or other things of that sort. And then another question, and this one is is far more broad and just thinking about observational data overall. One of the big things that that we wrestle with on the podcast is always looking at from these observational studies, the conclusions, and and more specifically, the implications or recommendations that the authors make. And and we see sometimes it's, it's hard for the authors to get that just right. Sometimes they'll go on the side of really not making any call to action, no recommendations for doing anything based on that. So I think sometimes the natural inclination is to wonder, well, uh, I'm not sure this information did much for us clinically. Right. And then sometimes you get the other extreme of, of authors taking pure observational data and making very strong recommendations. Sometimes that, that go far beyond what their data in and of itself can actually support. So how do you deal with that? When you think about this, this is observational data. There's going to be some limitations based on that. But how do you try to thread that needle and, and come up with recommendations that are both actionable, but also clearly supported by the data that you've reviewed? I think you bring up a great point. 
And I would say observational data does have its limitations, but it could be very helpful in identifying problem areas in healthcare and policy that require further investigation or intervention. So I personally think that all healthcare problems that we can capture in this observational data can spark to clinical change and policy that to improve healthcare. But I think the question is, well, like what would that change be? And so observational data can tell us, well, here is a problem, but then we need further investigation to understand why are we seeing the findings that we're seeing and then how can we successfully address them through rigorously testing different changes in practice and policy and then kind of understanding our findings a little bit better. So we're going to think about that here in a little bit, in particular with the article that you uh, did and that we reviewed. We're going to think about the recommendations that you and your co-authors made. But before we get to that, for those uh, listeners who it's maybe been a few months since they read your article or, or listened to our review of it, why don't you give us a really high-level overview of that investigation and the findings that you all presented in your report? Okay. So the aim of the study was to examine national trends in pediatric DKA. So we used data from 2006, 9, 12, and 16 from the Kids Inpatient Database to identify DKA emissions in those with diabetes less than 20 years old. And so we described DKA admissions rate per 10,000 admissions and then per 10,000 population with diabetes over time and then across several patient and hospital factors. We also looked at length of stay and admission costs as well. And what we found was DKA rates per 10,000 admissions increased from 120 in 2006 to um, 217 in 2016. And then in overall, we found higher DKA rates occurring in those 18 to 20 years old, females, those of Black race, and those without private insurance. And then regarding trends over time, when we looked at subgroups of patients, we saw a global rise in DKA among basically all patient groups, but we did see a few notable within group differences. We saw a greater increase in DKA across time in young adults, males, those without private insurance, and then those from non-urban areas. Thanks for that great overview. And when we were looking at that, we definitely found that very compelling and very helpful to understand a lot of the changes that you uncovered and pointed out there. One of the specific aspects that we wrestled with a little bit and went back and forth uh, to try to understand it really well was the impact of age on the risk for DKA admissions. And part of that was this this recognition that as individuals get older, if you look at uh, groups of individuals based on their age, that the prevalence of type 1 diabetes will be increasing as you go up in ages because it's almost always, fortunately, a chronic condition. And so the prevalence will increase. And so the risk, the number of people at risk for having an admission for DKA will increase based on that alone. And so trying to then to understand how much of an increased risk for DKA with age is purely based on increased prevalence base uh, or, or potentially based on something else entirely. And so walk us through how, how you dealt with that, how you looked at that, and, and maybe see if you can help us understand that just a little bit better. We really thought a lot about this and how to best address it, not just for age, but for other subgroups where the underlying rates of diabetes may be higher and could thus partially explain the higher rates of DKA. So first, we used a second data set, the National Health Interview Survey, NHIS, to estimate the total number of pediatric patients with diabetes in the U.S. across the subgroups we were interested in. So we could scale our number of DKA per population, which accounted for prevalence, in addition to DKA per hospital admission, which does not. So this helped us identify that differences in DKA emissions were not as stark at the population level, perhaps in part due to the change in prevalence. But one important caveat around this is that these numbers are just estimates. And so the NHIS only had about 400 pediatric patients with diabetes across all years. And so we were able to calculate these rates of DKA per population, but these estimates were less precise and thus resulting in like wider confidence intervals for the rates per population. So we actually don't have an ideal national database that can tell us the exact number of youth with diabetes in the U.S., including over time and by demographic characteristics. So there really isn't a perfect calculation for those rates, and it's quite difficult to capture that. And where I want us to spend a little bit of time as as we wrap up here is thinking about the conclusion of your article. And then we really liked that. And as we reviewed it, we wrestled with that. And specifically, you and your co-authors call for further study to better understand the barriers that do lead to those increased frequencies of DKA, particularly among different groups. 
So when you think about that and, and when you had that recommendation in your mind, what specifically were you thinking of? So in other words, what sort of study could come out that you think would be feasible to design in the first place, but then also at the same time, in addition to being feasible to perform, would be very likely to yield actionable results of the sort that you think we would need to make the changes that are required to prevent these high levels of decay admission? Sure. That's definitely a great point because I think the point of this research is to figure out the next steps and how we can address some of the problems that we're identifying. And so I think qualitative studies are one of the most powerful research approaches we have to understand barriers to care because it's really easy to speculate what factors are the biggest barriers for patients, but our speculations may or may not actually be accurate. So I think the best approach is to ask the right patients, meaning a diversity of patients with the focus on those who we know are most vulnerable to the outcomes we are trying to avoid. And it's not a coincidence that the same populations that have poor outcomes are the same populations that are understudied. And yes, we know that these groups are more challenging to engage in research, but we will need researchers who are willing to rise to that challenge, establish community partners, et cetera, if we're going to successfully understand the barriers these vulnerable populations face and then how to appropriately intervene to improve their diabetes outcomes. And with that, I would like to thank Estelle Everett for joining me for this special edition of Endocrine Feedback Loop. I learned a great deal as I know that you all did as well and hope that you will join us again for our next episode. This has been Endocrine Feedback Loop. Endocrine Feedback Loop is brought to you as a members-only benefit of Endocrine Society with production oversight by Maggie Graham.